So I was kind of using like data science as like a backdoor to problems where it was like, I could, I could talk to people, figure out what they're working on and kind of figure out how the, the software and algorithms, like uh, analytical methods they were using mapped to problems that I had worked on previously and, uh, you know, sort of use those um, analogies to move sideways from work that I had done outside the biomedical domain into the biomedical domain. You're listening to Gradient Descent, a show about machine learning in the real world. And I'm your host, Lucas Bewald. I've known Jeff Hammerbacher for a long time, and he's had a truly incredible career. He started off running what was essentially the data science team at Facebook, and then founded Cloudera, which was a really early company in the data science space and, and recently went private after being public for quite a long time. But mid Cloudera, he actually left and became a professor at Mount Sinai and started his own lab. Now he's working on a company called Related Sciences that does drug discovery with machine learning. I actually run out of time talking to him today because I have so many questions and his stories are so good. This is a super fun one. Jeff, thanks so much for uh, for doing this. Yeah, man, good to see you. Um, yeah, good to see you. I, um, you know, I want to get into the stuff that you're working on at the Hammer Lab, but you know, this this is obviously for a lot of people have kind of come up through data science that that we record this for, and I thought it might be interesting to start just with your your kind of early career, just because I think people would want to know about it, and you had such an outsized impact on the field of data science. I, I was kind of curious just to sort of hear your story about like how you came into Facebook and how you. I think you started a data science team there, right? Yeah. So. Let's see. I landed at Facebook in early 2006. I, my initial title was research scientist. And then, yeah, eventually I, uh, ran a group of what we would now, we would soon call data scientists. And the next step after that was absorbing what we called data infrastructure at the time, uh, which would, I suppose, now be called data engineering. And so, yeah, we ended up with a team called the data team. Uh, it was almost 30 people by the time I left. So it was pretty good sized. And yeah, our, our mandate was effectively to collect all the data generated by the site and then do analyses on it to improve the business outcomes. And it was a, rapid learning experience. I was there for less than three years and, you know, we went from effectively zero, uh, data for offline analytics to petabytes per day. Um, so, and there was no real like technology to support doing that at the time. So it was, I was really spending a lot of time talking to people at like Yahoo and, uh, eBay and Google, uh, just trying to figure out what was going on. Uh, commercial vendors, it wasn't really a, blip on the radar yet to do uh, data at that scale. So yeah, it was pretty intense and I learned a lot and I met a lot of great people uh, and it eventually led to starting Cloudera. Uh, and so people might not, people might not realize, you know, back then, like it, it wasn't standard practice even to keep all your data. I remember talking to the CTO of eBay, even though I think a little bit after that, and you're saying, you know, we only keep like 1% of our click logs because it's just too expensive to, to store it all. I mean, why, why do you think like Facebook? was so out on the forefront of, of doing this kind of data analysis? We were certainly not ahead of Google. <laughs> so we weren't, <laughs> sure. I, wouldn't, I would never claim That's us. That's a high bar. <laughs> yeah, I wouldn't claim that we were at the forefront. I, I would say it was kind of a necessity as a mother of invention in that we just had so much data and so much user activity that we wanted to understand. And our product was evolving so quickly. Uh, so I think the need for like offline analytics uh, was really driven home to executives during the newsfeed launch. Mm -hmm. uh, so this is like something that's probably like incomprehensible to most people listening, but <laughs> Facebook didn't have a newsfeed uh, when I joined. So, and we went and launched that, uh, you know, like six to eight months after I joined. And, you know, I remember getting a phone call. So Mark and Chris Hughes, two of the founders, were doing Facebook's like first ever press tour. Uh, like newsfeed was like a big deal, and we had a PR and marketing function at the company uh, finally. And so they had like lined up all of these interviews on the East Coast, and you know, 
it, the launch was like a disaster. <laughs> they, were, they were out here like fielding questions and freaking out because, uh, you know, the, the narrative around the response was very negative or around the product launch was very negative, but our metrics were pretty solid. So uh, we were spending a lot of time really uh, digging in to understand what was happening to user activity to try and uh, distinguish the narrative to distinguish like the what the what the users were telling us from what the uh, the press was telling us, and then mm-hmm. kind of helping to decide whether we needed to roll the thing back. <laughs> you know, it was a pretty big kind of crisis at the company, and so uh, using data to help uh, stabilize product decision making, and then I think after that it became a more critical function at the company. Uh, but it took a long time. I think growth was another big motivator. Um, it's another part of the Facebook story that's not really well understood is that we kind of went sideways for like six months there um, in like late 2007, early 2008. Then there was a lot of stress uh, in the executive team and the engineering team. And a large chunk of people got like reorged to really focus on growth. Uh, and that ended up creating probably like uh, the highest level awareness that we needed to invest in uh, in data infrastructure and, and data science. I think those are probably the two things that I look back on and think, uh, and also just internationalization. It's tightly coupled to growth, but at some point, you know, you're navigating the product through your intuitive understanding of what people in your demographic cohort uh, want to see from the product, but then you have to transition to understanding what uh, you know, a, a grandma in Turkey once from Facebook. And at that point, you really need to start flying with instruments. Uh, so, so yeah, I, I think those are kind of some milestones that I, I can recall from, you know, over a decade ago. And um, it's funny even to like think back to then, but, you know, NoSQL was not really a thing a lot of people knew about. Like, like what was your tech stack in, in 2008? Do you remember, like, where are you storing all this data and how you're querying it? Oh, totally. Yeah. So when I landed in 2006... The tech stack, what, well, first of all, in 2005, they didn't use version control. So <laughs> this is like one of my favorite things about Facebook was uh, they, they had a cron job that ran every night and, uh, you know, tarred up the source code and copied it off to, uh, to storage. Like that was how they did version control. So it was a different time. I mean, GitHub didn't exist. Uh, it, it, Subversion was kind of the dominant uh, source control product. So the tech stack was the LAMP stack. It was, you know, Linux, Apache, MySQL, PHP. And, you know, uh, Facebook played a big role in adding another M to that stack, Memcache D, uh, which was essentially, uh, I guess, Redis-ish. <laughs> it was like the, the current modern um, thing I would refer to as a, you know, as a key value cache um, mm-hmm. so that you didn't have to hit the database. It was basically like... If we hit the database, we had failed on the application side uh, mm-hmm. because it was just, you know, the, the user activity was so high. So it had to all come out of the cache. So in terms of the stack for analytics, um, when I got there, Dustin Moskovitz, one of the founders, had built something called the watch page. Uh, and the watch page was powered by a cron job that woke up every minute, uh, issued a query to every MySQL uh, production database uh, to just gather some stats about user activity, and then pulled the results of those queries down into another offline MySQL database, which contained like a rolling uh, time series of per minute uh, metrics. And that was great. And we used it for a long time to just, you know, that's what everybody internally was watching to see like user signups. And that's where a lot of the metrics around like daily active, monthly active would get defined and pushed out. But we had no offline data store to do uh, like analytics work on. These were summaries that were computed at the time of the query and pulled back. So you couldn't do any kind of post hoc uh, analytics over it. So the initial attempt at a tech stack for a uh, data warehouse was to use Oracle. So I actually, that was me. Uh, you know, I didn't make the purchasing decision, but I had to do like a lot of the installation maintenance of that thing. So I, I very clearly remember the Sun T2000 uh, server that we were running on. And obviously this is all co-load, uh, not in the cloud. Um, right at the time and, you know, fiber channel interconnect to a, uh, a network attached storage device and running Oracle, uh, Oracle rack at the time. And was it, was it sharded or is this like one machine is holding so the whole rack thing? was a shared storage, uh, distributed compute. So a bit like the architectures that we end up th- with today in the cloud, uh, where we have kind of this bottleneck to get to your object store. Uh, that's kind of how databases work. And these were blocks 
stores. You know, I said network attack storage, but it was actually a storage area network, uh, which was speaking a block protocol to the server, not a file oriented protocol. So, uh, you know, this is, that's how databases were built at the time. It was insane. It, it was insane to conceive of writing a database that wrote to a file system. Uh, mm -hmm. They had to talk to the block layer. The file system was just going to slow you down. So yeah, so we ran Oracle Rack, which was, uh, sh like I said, shared storage, distributed compute, and it fell over immediately. Uh, you know, like we, we actually, I remember we hired a, a DBA, a database administrator, and he quit on his third day. Uh, he was just like, I've never seen it. Like, this is crazy. Like, what are you doing? So, you know, like I was reading a lot of, there's this guy, Tom Kite, uh, who wrote a lot of books about Oracle database internals. Uh, I was reading like a lot of Tom Kite books, learning a lot about like tuning, um, you know, his early multi-core, these like Sun Niagara chips were, were kind of like one of the first multi-core, like, you know, we're, now we're all stuck with it because Moore's law has basically ended, but uh, right. the, the, it was kind of the beginning of the end there. So learning a lot about, you know, how to, to scale up on multi-core settings and then just starting to look around frantically for something that could scale past that. So, mm -hmm. uh, you know, so we had two sources of data at the time. We had production databases, but then we had the major source of data that just ended up totally flattening us. We called it Falcon. And uh, it was built by a guy named James Wang to power the news feed. And it was just an event log. Uh, so it was the kind of thing that you would pass through Kafka today, but it was just this homegrown C++ toolkit. It was eventually replaced by Scribe, which we made open source and was a popular tool for log tailing. That was written by a guy named Bobby Johnson. So the, the Falcon logs were the vast majority of data, all the event data. Anytime a, a user did anything on the site, we would log it. And then we wanted to use that to reconstitute uh, information about user activities. So, so Falcon is what really ended up just knocking us down. And so I was frantically looking for a new tech stack beyond just an Oracle rack uh, instance. And there were a few alternatives. So at the time, there were a lot of shared nothing distributed database companies uh, targeting the data warehousing market. So Natiza had been very successful using like custom silicon ASICs to accelerate queries in a shared nothing architecture. And they had gotten bought by IBM for like 400 plus million. And that really caused a lot of new entrants uh, to come into the market. So these were companies like Greenplum, Astrodata, Vertica, uh, Parexcel. Uh, so a lot of interesting uh, distributed database companies, but most of them couldn't scale to what we needed. Uh, so honestly, the Yahoo experience uh, was what I model a lot of our tech stack after. And you know, you'll be familiar with that from your time there. <laughs> uh, so. You know, they had a similar SQL querying over event log data infrastructure uh, called Mina, uh, My NetApp, which unfortunately I didn't spend a lot of time talking publicly about, but I managed to get to know the people that built it and learn about how it worked. And it was it was effectively like a Hadoop like architecture, but instead of uh, a data node in a, in a distributed file system, uh, they had NetApp uh, filers where they were uh, querying data over. And so we hired a guy named Suresh Anthony who built effectively a very rapidly implemented version of Mina called Cheetah uh, to kind of bridge us between the Oracle era and whatever came next. And then we started really looking around and we found the Hadoop group uh, at Yahoo, uh, you know, Eric Baldeschweiler and, and folks, uh, Ono Malley, uh, they were doing, a, and Doug Cutting, obviously, uh, were doing some really interesting work to, you know, pick up this work that had been published by Google about MapReduce and the Google file system and implement it as an open source project. And everybody thought it was insane at Facebook. Writing stuff on the JVM was just very much frowned upon. It was a very polyglot programming languages environment, but it was not, the only exclusion was Java uh, from, that, from that zoo. Uh, so it was a really, it was an uphill battle to convince people that this was going to be something that might solve our problems. But eventually it became a pretty significant uh, component of our infrastructure. And we ended up writing a lot of database uh, utilities on top of it. Uh, so a project like Hive uh, to put a SQL query interface and a metadata manager uh, in front of the distributed file system and MapReduce implementation uh, ended up becoming a really significant component uh, of our analytics tech stack there. And so it sounds like you had some of this infrastructure built when kind of the growth stopped. I think a lot of people, you know, myself included, can kind of relate to the the pain of like growth stopping and trying to figure out how to get it going again. Like, I mean, I guess was there like sort of some analysis, some piece of analysis that you felt like you did to kind of get that restarted, or was it just like a lot of little things? Like, how did that uh, go down? I mean, <laughs> I've actually gotten a cease and desist from Facebook before for saying this in, a, in an interview, <laughs> but the honest answer is the Hotmail contact importer. 
Um, <laughs> you know, it I was, remember that. Yeah. Yeah. It was, that was the era. <laughs> like that was the social graph of 2006 to 2008. It was Hotmail. Uh, you know, Yahoo Mail to a lesser extent, like a 10th and Gmail even smaller than Yahoo Mail. But so it was really about kind of, uh, you know, what do they call them? Like dark design tactics or something. <laughs> it, you know, it was these things where it was like, uh, put in your email address and we'll, we'll, we'll invite all your friends mm-hmm. and we'll just auto select all of the emails and obfuscate that. And if you click, okay, we're just going to spam your inbox and spam your, your mailing list. And, and that was really how Facebook grew. There was a lot of stuff after that that was a lot more targeted. So in our group, uh, we had a guy named Itamar Rosen, uh, who was my first hire and is still there. Oh, no way. Um, He's a classmate of mine. Yeah. 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 He's still there. I got to, I was just uh, texting with him yesterday. I got to catch up and see how that's (laughs) going. But uh, so Itamar, you know, there's a guy, Matt Kohler, who was an executive who was really one of the key kind of strategists for early Facebook and Kohler, I'm sure at the behest of Mark and some of the board, or potentially it was, it was his own idea. I'm not sure exactly who, but it was communicated to me through, through Matt Kohler. He pulled me and Naomi Gleit, uh, who you may have also been a classmate of if I, if I know my Stanford uh, <laughs> connections. Um, he pulled me and Naomi and he said, you know, hey, growth is an issue. Let's start dedicating some analyses to it. Um, and we started meeting regularly and, uh, and, and doing analyses and, and Itamar joined not long after. And so Itamar generated this weekly growth report, which was a set of standard metrics, as well as a deep dive every week that was distinct and and specific to some high level question we had at the time. And that growth report, you know, it was, was, we turned it into a PDF to make it look nice and sent it out to the company. Oh yeah. I used a lot of LaTeX back in the day for my math notes in college. So I like to- You you tee that up in LaTeX and then use that (laughs) as a company report. That's amazing. I, you know, you, you do it for like a year and all of a sudden you're fluent. And so then it's like hard to go back because it just looks so much better when it's in like a nice, lo- I mean, there's all kinds of better ways to do it today, but that was my solution then. So yeah, so Itamar would send out the growth report uh, with a lot of input from Naomi and, and Kohler. And, and that became sort of a, a focal point for analyses to better understand growth. And then ultimately, uh, you know, a growth team was built. And I, if I recall correctly, James Wang, the guy that Row Falcon ended up being the engineering manager for that growth team, and he he played a big role in uh, in kind of the initial work that they did over there. Wow, that was really fun. T- thanks for taking me through that. And then I guess I have the same question on um, Cloudera, which is also kind of an iconic company in in data science. I remember when you were starting it and, and kind of thinking about the market size would be, but I guess what was the what what really prompted you to to start it? And can you tell me a little bit about the kind of early days of getting that off the ground? Sure. Uh, well, we tried to start it earlier in 2008. So this guy, Christoph Bashilia, uh, was at Google and was teaching a MapReduce class at University of Washington and was really trying to push Google to, to proselytize their approach to data management and, and data analysis into the academic environment. And he was using Hadoop in that course. So he was uh, he was connected to the Hadoop community through that, and there was so Microsoft made a bid to buy Yahoo in early two thousand and eight, and that catalyzed. So so Christoph and I had been chatting about what would it look like to start a company to support Hadoop, and because he needed it for his work and I needed it for my work, and when Microsoft said they were going to buy. Uh, or Yahoo, uh, then we were like, oh boy, we really need to accelerate the timing on this. So that was like early 2008. And we had a third guy who was going to be a co-founder, uh, a guy that I had gotten to know because we interviewed him to be VP of engineering at Facebook. And we actually offered him and he turned us down. Mike Abbott uh, was his name. So Mike is now at Apple running a big swath of their uh, software development. And, and Mike was, uh, you know, I really hit it off with him during the interview process and I stayed in touch with him. And I was like, hey, man, like this is he, he had a lot of experience with database internals. He had a started a company called Composite Software that did federated, federated query, uh, which I guess today would be called a data mesh. And Mike was a really smart guy. And I really wanted him to come start the company. But he actually had some personal life issues that made it not really work out. So it kind of fell apart in like March 08. But that got Christoph and I talking and he kind of started working on his own. And he recruited a guy named Mike Olson. Uh, who I had followed for a while because Mike was the CEO of SleepyCast Software, the maker of BerkeleyDB, 
uh, which is an embedded database uh, that was very, very successful. Uh, the killer app was like Active Directory. So Mike had sold his company to Oracle, had done two years and was on the way out. Christoph had recruited him to, uh, he actually incorporated the company as Cloudera with two R's and uh, Mike was the CEO. But uh, another guy, a third guy, Amar Awadala, who you probably know from your time at Yahoo, he had ran a group called Product Intelligence Engineering that was very successful. Amar had spun out of Yahoo and was convinced by a guy named Andrew Braccia at Excel to be an entrepreneur in residence at Excel Partners. And Amar was actually at the time working on a, um, a uh, like a spot market for cloud resources, uh, which was very early in 2008 to, uh, to have this idea. So we were kind of like, maybe this isn't the right time for that. You know, maybe someday it'll work. And I was, uh, so I, I spun out of Facebook uh, to do an entrepreneur residence uh, program at Excel Partners as well. And I had actually hooked up with a guy named Eric Vishria, who's now a partner at Benchmark. And we were working on like a consumer energy, uh, like monitoring, like demand monitoring uh, system. And eventually like Amr and I got to chatting and Christoph really catalyzed the whole thing. So he and Mike were kind of moving forward and Amr and I were kind of like, eh, we should probably sort of hop on there. Uh, so, so Amr, uh, me, Christoph and Mike ended up sort of reconstituting it as Cloudera with one R and then just, uh, you know, refounded the company going forward. And, and yeah, that's, that's how it ultimately, we ended up hiring Doug Cutting about a year later once we had established some credibility, but it was just the four of us when we got moving. And what did you work on in the early days? Like it must've been a pretty big change going from running a, a data science team to founding a company. Oh yeah, for sure. On the on, on the one hand, yes. On the other hand, no, because at Facebook, it was a very like sink or swim culture. And I really felt like I built that data team with no real supervision. I basically went around the block once a week with Adam D'Angelo uh, to just kind of like have a conversation for an hour. And he was very helpful about kind of just clearing roadblocks for me and helping me think through strategic things. But ultimately it was, it was just, you know, something that I thought needed to be built. And they just kind of said, go build it. I don't think anyone up top at Facebook was like, let's hire 30 people to work on a data team. I think I just kept hiring people. And at some point they looked over and they're like, that's a pretty big data team. So, so I really, you know, like people talk about like entrepreneur uh, or whatever, like, um, and, and I guess it's, it did feel a bit like that. So I, I did kind of feel like I was just like building a little company inside of Facebook. And ultimately the Clutter Road product roadmap was just sort of like the Facebook data infrastructure product roadmap, just like done as a, um, it, most of the reason I started Clutter or I got involved with Clutter, to be honest, was like, I just wanted to see the things that I wanted to build exist in the world. Mm -hmm. And I knew that Facebook, they were kind of entering a period where they weren't going to be quite so excited to, it was more of a buy versus build uh, period, which made complete sense given the scale of the business and the success of the business. So I was kind of like, yeah, I'd rather, I'd rather build some of this stuff. So, so yeah, so we got to work. Hiring was obviously a lot harder to hire for a, a random startup versus like, you know, the hottest startup in Silicon Valley. Um, so I had to do a lot of legwork on hiring. And then just figuring out what to build. So sequencing, like I knew what the end state was going to look like, but I didn't know how we were going to get there. So figuring out what to build first uh, was pretty hard. So, so we started with a couple open source projects to just get data into the clutter environment, uh, a project called Scoop and a project called Flume that were dedicated to like database and log data in particular. Honestly, I saw Splunk at the time and I was like, I want to get to a pricing structure that looks like that. Uh, I, I think like the, the, the reason why data companies work in 2021 is the consumption-based pricing and Splunk had that figured out in 2005. <laughs> um, so, but we never really could figure it out at Cloudera. We ended up getting stuck with a more Oracle Teradata-like uh, pricing model. So yeah, so we were working on it, effectively filling out the stack uh, to become like a, a, a vertically integrated data platform, whatever they're calling them these days, but you know, a place where you would collect data, put it, structure it, query it, analyze it, fit models to it. Like, you know, what, what Snowflake and Databricks are trying to build today. Like it was a very obvious uh, product roadmap. And so that's what we want to build. We just couldn't figure out how to build it or how to get there. What, what the right sequencing was to get there. And the other thing that we had to do is kind of like swap out components over time. Like we all knew that there was like a, a limited, there was a shelf life to the core Hadoop projects. And so we were kind of trying to think beyond it. And so how do you make that transition from these like legacy products to what we felt like could actually service production enterprise workloads competitively with what other vendors were offering. Uh, so things like Impala for, uh, uh, for query engine or Kudu for, for table storage were always something we wanted to build, but just had to figure out when and how to get it out. 
I mean, I think one thing that, you know, was kind of interesting at the time. I mean, it seems so wrong in retrospect that it's hard to believe people thought this, but I remember actually talking to, to Matt Kohler about, about cloud air and he was thinking, you know, how many companies would really use this? You know, maybe it's like tens or, you know, maybe like a hundred or something like that, like at the time. And I think even you expressed a little bit of doubt to me when you were starting. I mean, like, did you feel like, did you feel worried about the market size or like, how did you, how did you think about that? Was it, were you just like, sure that it would work or was that no i mean for me it was about manifesting a product vision not about building a huge company mm, interesting. Uh, so i i didn't expect it to get as big as it did or people to care as much as they did mm. when i was leaving facebook i kind of wanted to work on like a super nerdy infrastructure software company uh like what could be nerdier than like a dupe <laughs> uh and like you know within a year we were in the new york times and that part of the, like the hype around it was always a huge turnoff to me. It wasn't something that I wanted. Uh, I wanted to hire like the best engineers from Sun and VMware and Oracle and Google and get them to build open source infrastructure that would allow any company to do what Google could do. Like that was what I wanted to do. And, and whether or not it had commercial value at the scale that uh, would necessitate like venture returns it wasn't that critical to me because we didn't raise that much money. Our series A was $5 million. Our series B was like eight or $9 million. Like these aren't even like seed rounds anymore. Like, so what we were building was different from what it became. And so I never really, I mean, I agree with Kohler at the time. Like it was, I didn't worry about who was going to use this. Cause I just worried about kind of completing the product. And I just knew everybody was going to need it, to be honest. Like everybody was going to have petabyte scale data. I didn't know in what form they were going to be storing and analyzing it, but I wanted to solve problems to facilitate that world. Um, but yeah, our series B was a brutal fundraise. Our series A was easy because Amr and I were both entrepreneurs and residents. And so we had two partners who loved us and believed in us and they would have given us money to start whatever we wanted. Uh, but then our series B, yeah, we, we, we ran around Sandhill and I actually remember I got a nice note from, uh, uh, Dana Stadler at matrix partners a few years after, cause he just like beat us up in the pitch where he was just like, <laughs> I don't ever expect you'll get a seven figure deal for this. He was like, and you'll probably get less than 10, uh, you know, six figure deals for this. Like, it's just, there just isn't a market. You should just pack it up now. This was like a, a science project. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And uh, you know, you're, you're in those meetings and you just hear that over and over and over again. And it's kind of like, yeah, that's, that's like a valid position to take. I didn't, I didn't necessarily disagree with it. So yeah, I, I, I couldn't be happier. And the fact that they're still focused on open source is quite cool. Do you feel any frustration that they're not a more iconic company? I mean, they were so early with the strategy that's worked so well. And it's hard to say, like, I don't know, whatever their $5 billion market cap is, you know, not a wild success. But it does sort of seem like they missed kind of people shifting to Spark. Like, does that feel, I don't know, do you, do you, does that bother you at all? Well, I mean, I'm kind of weird in that, like, I don't like big companies. So <laughs> uh, to me, it's not a success if you have like a hundred billion dollar market cap, but you've got all closed source software and you have it like, like, so to me, I always talked about Cloudera as like an engine for turning, uh, you know, VC first and then company enterprise dollars into open source software. So for me, I look at the public goods that were created. So I look at the standards, the software, those, those kinds of things. And, and so in that sense, I, and, and honestly, like I made plenty of money, I'm going to be okay. So <laughs> I really like, like people who sure, want sure. another zero uh, like, I, at this point, it's all going to some kind of like foundation. You know what I mean? Right. Like there's no like material need that's going to be resolved by um, if there was another zero on the end of Clutter's valuation. So I like, I honestly don't know why people want more uh, money than, than what we were able to, to make. And that was honestly a pretty big surprise anyway. I didn't start Clutter to make money. So, so for me, I look at things like, uh, you know, Arrow and Parquet and Ibis and, and other kinds of like open source infrastructure, even Hue, uh, our, our user interface has become adopted by pretty much all the cloud providers. So, so I look more at like, how do you change the tools that people use uh, in their, and how do you change their thinking? Like, you know, Impala was really the first open source uh, vectorized code gen distributed query engine. And it was something that everybody knew we needed to build. And I was really proud of it when we built it. And like, whose name is on the jersey at the end of the day, I don't really care. So it was more about kind of like impacting the universe of ideas and, and public goods. 
Uh, and I'm really happy with a lot of the work that we did. I mean, I will say, I think just being on the JVM is just tough for day-to-day -day developers. Uh, mm -hmm. So it was hard to, you know, you can impact enterprise, but ultimately like no one uses enterprise stuff in their day-to-day. -day. Like Snowflake is a huge company and they've built great technology, but it doesn't change how I do data analysis on a day-to-day -day because like, I just, I don't need like a super expensive data warehouse for my like day-to-day -day data analysis. And, and that was, you know, so I, we built a lot of stuff off the JVM uh, at Cloudera subsequent to founding. And I guess I, I just, it, it was a funny era to get stuck in the JVM. I wish we'd have pushed more Python. I mean, we ended up buying uh, Datapad, uh, Wes McKinney's company, and we had Wes McKinney in the company for a while. And then it was after I was, I kind of checked out. I was like founder emeritus at the time. I referred to myself, mm -hmm. so I, I could never really convince our head of product management to like really push on the Python ecosystem harder. But yeah, you can kind of see that's where everybody's going now. And I think if there's anything that I regret, it's it's not being able to influence people to get more into like the Py data ecosystem sooner. Mm, interesting. And I mean, I guess I also wanted to ask you about this incredible career transition that you made that I, I I'm just so impressed by to go into to research. Can you talk about like how, how you did that? Like how you got up to speed enough to, to start your lab, how you learned about almost like a totally different field? Yeah, totally. Uh, so, you know, 2012 ish at Cloudera, we were four years in and it was bigger than I ever expected it to be. You know, I'd, I'd replaced myself twice first as VP product and then VP of data science. Uh, you know, I'd hired people who were better than me at that job. So the only thing left to do is kind of hire a professional CEO. And we kicked off that search. And, and to be honest, I was also having a lot of sort of misgivings and also health issues that just made sort of being a, a high uh, intensity uh, startup founder executive job in San Francisco, just very unpalatable to me. Mm -hmm. uh, and when I was thinking about what I wanted to do next, I really wanted to focus on finding a domain where I could do data science and not get bored of the entities under analysis. So I had started my career on Wall Street and very quickly realized I didn't really want to think about money all day. And then I moved to Facebook and pretty quickly realized I didn't want to think about how people like navigate consumer web products all day. But I loved the software and methods at both jobs. Like, like I really, it was like a weird thing. I really enjoyed my jobs. I just could not care less about like, what the product was at each of those jobs. And so Cloudera was always to me like a waypoint where I was like, hey, I want to be able to do data analysis scale. Tools don't exist to do that with open source software. So like this is our best hope of just getting some tools for doing data analysis scale into the world. So I'm going to do that. But I always like I do data analysis. I don't necessarily see myself making tools for data analysis for the rest of my life. And so in 2012, I started thinking about like different domains where I might want to, where I might not get bored. Mm -hmm. And biomedicine was just, uh, you know, a big expansive domain where I, I thought there's a lot of sophisticated work happening, but the, the technical infrastructure was actually pretty limited. We had sold into pharma companies at Cloudera and they were some of the last to adopt uh, mm -hmm. modern technology stacks. We had partnered with some large academic institutions. And I saw their infrastructure and it was very outmoded and, and slow moving. And so I thought, oh, hey, like there's some things that we learned over here that could be useful over there. And I probably won't get bored of what's going on. And, you know, I had gotten to know. So in 2008, when I left Facebook, I had looked into the biomedical domain to do a startup and I had met a bunch of interesting companies uh, at the time. So this is like when 23andMe was getting started. And, oh, there's another company that was just like 23andMe that I went and visited as well. I can't remember their name. But it, so I got to know a, a group of people in the, in the biomedical field uh, who had started a nonprofit called Sage BioNetworks that was creating like a shared infrastructure for storing and analyzing data in a pre-competitive open source fashion. And they said, they asked me to come and advise them on data infrastructure and open source strategies as they were creating this nonprofit and eventually asked me to join the board. And so I served on the board of that nonprofit and, and through that lens, I got to see and meet a lot of interesting people and it kind of helped confirm for me that this was a field that I would enjoy working in. And ultimately what catalyzed me moving into an actual role in that field was Eric Schott, one of the, my fellow board members at Sage Bionetworks, one of the creators of Bio, Sage Bionetworks. He was recruited to run the Department of Genetics at Mount Sinai in New York City. Mm -hmm. And 
I like New York a lot more than San Francisco. It's just, you know, I, I moved to San Francisco from New York and I was very dismayed. I was like, I thought this was supposed to be a city. Like everything closes at like uh, midnight or two. I don't even remember when it closed. You know, it was certainly wasn't 4 a.m. like in New York City. And it, and it was like so tiny and like the public transportation was terrible. And so I was just like, I was always very underwhelmed with San Francisco as a place to live. It was so cold all the time. And so I was very excited about New York City as a place to live relative to San Francisco. And I was excited about doing something in the biomedical domain with software and data. And it was actually, we were getting beers at the Nut House on, uh, <laughs> in Palo Alto, which I'm sure you know. And he just kind of said, hey, you know, like, he, he was having me kind of like talk to people over there to kind of just like talk them through what they could build. And he was like, what would you think about just like being out here you know, with an actual position at Mount Sinai. And I thought about it and ultimately I was like, okay, that sounds like fun. So we kind of worked something out with Cloudera where I was like notionally part-time. So I was going back and forth between San Francisco and New York for a while. And then in, in the fall of 2013, this is really when I was like full-time in New York and started hiring people into the lab. So I had a year to just like read a lot of textbooks, talk to a lot of the people who were working around, play around with the software. I've always been autodidactic. I got terrible grades in school. Um, it was always about like reading and thinking more than it was about like, doing homework for me. But you got um, terrible grades, but you went, you went to Harvard, right? How does that? Yeah. Uh, that <laughs> so it's a little bit complicated. I had a good SAT score. I started getting terrible grades junior year of high school. And so I had, I guess, enough good grades to sort of buoy my grades, my overall GPA. And then I played baseball. So I ended up getting into Harvard uh, primarily as an athlete and an SAT score and then like a decent GPA. But yeah, so I, I was, I, it, yeah, it was basically like once I hit 16 that I stopped caring about school. So yeah, I think early Jeff was engaged enough to achieve uh, a GPA that was not going to be fully dismissed by Harvard during the admissions process, thankfully. Mm -hmm. But yeah, I guess you've done an incredible job of quickly learning really hard topics. So, I mean, uh, yeah, that, that, that makes sense. So, so you, you got up to speed on, I mean, I, I actually like, I try to research all the people that I talked to and I was looking through your list of papers and I, I could barely like parse the, the title to them, honestly. <laughs> yeah. You know, you talk to people who are doing work, you read papers, like review papers are key for me, you know, finding a good review paper on a topic and, and then figuring out who wrote it and then what their research research is. Uh, and just finding like kindred spirits, uh, people who think like you do and, and being able to just converse with them and, interactively uh, map a domain. You know, I had had biology education previously, like thankfully Harvard is a liberal arts education. So I had done courses on DNA and neuroscience and molecular biology. So I, I had the basics. So, uh, so yeah, just reading a lot of papers and, and like software is a good angle. So like I used to reference a lot, um, John Tukey, uh, who's kind of a proto data scientist. And uh, he has a, a quote where he said, you know, I love being a statistician because I get to play in everyone's backyard. Um, so I was kind of using like data science as like a backdoor to problems where it was like, I could, I could talk to people, figure out what they're working on and kind of figure out how the, the software and algorithms, like and analytical methods they were using mapped to problems that I had worked on previously. And, uh, you know, sort of use those um, analogies to move sideways from work that I had done outside the biomedical domain into the biomedical domain. So there's a lot of problems that you can find analogies for and, and choose methods for. So, you know, in particular, we were able to find a, a really cool problem in a domain of cancer immunotherapy. So when I was moving into biomedicine, 2012 uh, was really sort of, so 2011 uh, was a milestone year for the approval of a, um, immune checkpoint blockade drug. So this was a drug which, rather than targeting anything related to cancer, was actually targeting the immune system. Um, and so it, what it was actually targeting was like a T cell is a cell in your immune system that's responsible for cellular immunity, for killing bad cells. And so cancer cells are bad cells. And mm -hmm. so T cells were believed to be kind of the mediator of the immune response uh, to cancer. Uh, and there was this protein. So when a T cell gets angry and starts wanting to kill stuff, uh, it expresses an off switch uh, because it's very important that you be able to turn T cells off. T cells are very destructive and your body needs to be able to like resolve the immune response. And, and so, so the T cell exposes this off switch. And the notion behind immune checkpoint blockade is mm, cancer might have figured out how to press that off switch. And so what if we basically covered up the off switch 
uh, and we made it so that T cells couldn't be turned off by cancer. Perhaps that would cause the immune response to cancer to fully eradicate the tumor. And it worked uh, for a, a shockingly high percentage of people. And the most exciting thing about immune checkpoint blockade uh, at the time was these uh, Kaplan-Meier curves, these survival curves, where you could see that the immune checkpoint blockade was raising the floor for long-term survival of patients. It wasn't just advancing survival by a few months or years, and then ultimately everyone had the same sort of 10-year outcomes. It was like genuinely changing like five to 10-year outcomes. And obviously it took a long time to see that, but those results are holding. And that kind of durable response to cancer was like wildly unusual. And, 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 and so and was that, did, so is that something you worked on? Like so, so, I mean, ultimately, yes. So when I came to Mount Sinai, I had, I'd never heard of it, but there was a principal investigator at Mount Sinai named Nina Bardwaj. Uh, and Nina was a very successful uh, immunologist who was pursuing a few ideas for ways of stimulating an immune response to cancer. And uh, one of the things that she was very early on was an approach uh, called a neoantigen vaccine. And so this is a therapeutic vaccine. So most people think of prophylactic or protective vaccines. So something you get so that you don't get a disease. Therapeutic vaccines are given to stimulate uh, a specific immune response uh, while you currently have the disease and, and with the goal of curing it. So uh, a neoantigen vaccine is a therapeutic vaccine. And so uh, an antigen is a specific target of the immune response. And a neoantigen is an antigen created inside of a tumor cell due to the mutations that the tumor accrues. So cancer is a disease of the genome. Uh, the way that a cell becomes cancerous uh, is that it accumulates mutations uh, that equip it with behaviors that allow it to grow out of control. And these often there's kind of a positive feedback cycle. So getting additional mutations might damage like your DNA repair machinery, for example, that then causes you to accumulate even more mutations. So a lot of uh, cancers have, have accumulated many mutations and, and the more mutations you've accumulated, the more likely that one of those mutations is to have changed a protein produced by that cell in a way that causes that protein to become immunogenic, that is to create an immune response directed against it. So neoantigens are those subsequences of amino acids inside of proteins that have been altered by mutations accumulated by the tumor cells, which create these novel or neo antigenic targets for cancer. And so the idea was, what if we could sequence someone's tumor, sequence their, their normal tissue, look for mutations that are in the tumor, but not in the normal tissue, and uh, figure out which one of those mutations might generate an immune response for this particular patient. Mm -hmm. And for this particular patient, can we then synthesize a vaccine which will stimulate an immune response specifically against those, uh, those new antigens in their tumor uh, and suited for their immune system? Because everyone has a different immune, like, so, the other, so everyone's tumor is unique, but also everyone's immune system is unique. And so this is, you know, if you ever have to do like tissue or organ transplant and you get HLA typing done. So your, your HLA type is uh, what effectively determines the which amino acid subsequences of a protein your immune system cares about. So you had kind of two inputs. You had the HLA type of a patient, and then you had the somatic mutations, uh, that is the mutations present in the tumor and not in the germline uh, tissue. And those became inputs uh, into a predictive algorithm that would predict uh, these are the most likely to generate a response to neoantigens. And so that was kind of like the data science problem that we identified embedded within this uh, larger research. And, and at the time, you know, Nina's group was just leveraging uh, a web server built by uh, uh, another group that generated predictions for her. And so we kind of looked at it and said, oh, hey, like maybe we can build you a better predictor of, of new antigens. And then ultimately she was very trusting and allowed us to participate in the phase one clinical trial. So our group wrote like the computational component of the, of the clinical trial protocol and ultimately administered the computational algorithms that generated the vaccines that went into like actual humans. So that, that was like a pretty fun uh, research project to be involved in. And ultimately the software we wrote called McFlurry is, you know, so finally to get to something that might matter to your listeners uh, now that we're like 
you know, what, 48 minutes into the conversation. Uh, if you made it this far, machine learning happens here. So we ended up building a, a, a neural network that predicted neoantigens called McFlurry that's now, you know, one of the better uh, approaches and is still actively developed by several people. So just two questions to make sure I understand what's going on here. So one, does this mean that every single person gets a slightly different medicine based on their, and, and so like, can you even do a clinical trial where everyone's getting different? I always just sort of imagine a clinical trial, like everyone gets the same thing. I guess in this case, everyone sort of gets the same process. Is that right? Yeah, no, I mean, you've hit on a very fascinating question that has generated a conversation at the FDA that continues to this day, which is uh, when the therapeutic is an algorithm and not uh, a molecule, uh, you know, how do you administer a, a clinical trial that can generate evidence that the algorithm itself can create better outcomes? I mean, fortunately for us, uh, they were pretty understanding, allowed the trial to go forward. Um, I don't know how it's going to work. So we were building what's called a peptide vaccine. Um, so the actual molecules that we put into patients were little subsequences of amino acids called peptides together with what are called adjuvants. It's just general purpose immune stimulants to, to draw the attention of your immune system to those, to those peptides. And peptide vaccines are very well understood as a therapeutic modality and widely considered to be safe. Uh, so I think that certainly helped. But yeah, I mean, the intervention under study in that clinical trial is an algorithm, not a specific molecule. It's different for every patient. That's so cool. And, and I guess the other thing, maybe I, I was, I hope I'm following all the steps here, but it felt like, it felt pretty deterministic to me, like, like what's going on and then what intervention you would want. So what's the part where you need a, like a machine learning algorithm? Like, I guess the way you're explaining it, I was sort of thinking, oh, you, you kind of look at the genome and see where the problem is, and then you know the amino acid, and then you kind of know the medicine that you need. I guess, where's the uncertainty that, that requires you to use like an ML algorithm versus, I guess, just sort of like some kind of deterministic lo logic? Sure. So the HLA type of a patient is a set of genome sequences for, for genes that code for proteins, uh, which are highly polymorphic. That is, they're, 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 they're different across the population. So, you know, there's at least six of these proteins that matter. And every person has a, a distinct repertoire of like those six proteins. And so, so one input to the predictive model is the amino acid sequence of all six of those proteins. So that's like one, and, and that's pretty variable across the population. And then the other input to the model is a, a window of amino acids around every point mutation that occurs in your tumors that doesn't exist in your normal tissue. And cancers can accumulate hundreds, thousands, hundreds of thousands, sometimes even millions somatic mutations and, and like melanomas, which have the largest uh, mutational burden. So you, you end up with two sets of sequences as inputs, the neural network. And sorry, and what's the output of the neural network? So the output of the neural network is a predicted binding. So, so I don't want to explain exactly what HLA molecules do, but effectively uh, your body chops up all the proteins in your cells, uh, a subset of them for like processing, and it uh -huh. chops them up into smaller fragments. And your HLA proteins bind selectively to a subset of those smaller fragments, mm -hmm. which um, your body believes to be interesting to, to present for inspection to your immune system. Uh, so what, what you're ultimately trying to predict is the binding affinity between uh, peptide fragments uh, generated from the proteins in your tumor cells and the HLA proteins that are specific to your immune system. So ultimately, the thing you're predicting is this protein peptide binding affinity. And how did you get labeled data for this task? There's a group at, uh, uh, in San Diego that generates the vast majority of the label data, and they've done a great job of curating it. Uh, there's something called the Immune Epitope Database. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's a fairly difficult, we actually got to the point where I had a wet lab and I talked to the group in San Diego about generating measurements of our own to create label data and they were like, it's not worth it. It's really hard. Just use our stuff. Um, later in the lab's life, some new techniques for generating uh, labeled data from like in vivo tissue 
uh, came out that used a different measurement paradigm. And so some of the work that we did in the lab as I was leaving, and it was carried on by members of my lab uh, in the new labs they worked in, uh, was to leverage this alternative source of labeled data and bring it together with this early source of labeled data. So there, there's a few different places, a few different like assays, all of which are pretty difficult to run. So we, we don't get super high throughput. And and the the mass spectrometry data, the this like novel source of labeled data, often it's it's kind of like positives only. So you're not necessarily measuring. So, so there there's a lot of work that has to go in, and it you know as you're very much aware, like you don't just get to like pick up a data set and fit a model to it and call it a win. There's a lot of work that goes into kind of massaging the the training data to get it ready for machine learning. Is it important for this task or these kinds of tasks to use modern techniques like deep neural networks, or do you think simpler techniques would also work pretty well? So, you know, one of my frustrations is we didn't write more papers about the work that we did, because, you know, one of the theories that I have for this lab was to just like hire a bunch of people from industry and see if we could kind of turn them into academics. And the like one of the hardest things to do with people from industry is to convince them that writing a paper is worthwhile. But we did, we, we tried a lot of cutting edge. So one of the guys that worked on the problem early on was a guy named Alex Rubenstein, who's now actually a, a professor uh, University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill of in like a, a biomedical department, which is kind of cool. So he, he did a PhD at uh, NYU, like in the whole, you know, deep learning uh, craze. So he was pretty experienced with the models and we, we iterated through a lot of more complex. Um, this is sort of the era when like LSTMs were becoming uh, very exciting, uh, like sequence uh, learning uh, models. So you know, I think I remember like lasagna was a library built on top of Theano that uh, <laughs> yes. I had a, there was a guy like Colin Raffle who was really, really good with it, who came down to talk with us. And so we spent like, I think I feel like it was like, like Alex Graves and at DeepMind that had a lot of sequence to sequence learning. So, we, you know, we, and we went up to NeurIPS like three years in a row as a lab and, uh, and presented some work up there. So, so we were definitely kind of paying attention to what was happening in, in the state of the art for like learning on sequences. It didn't make a huge difference. Uh, you know, I remember like trying out like Siamese networks and things like this, and it it wasn't really moving the needle. So I, I, I honestly don't know where they landed, um, what the current version of McFlurry is from like a, a neural architecture standpoint. But I want to say that nothing we tried that was more exotic made a huge difference. Hmm. Uh, so ultimately, I think mostly no for that problem. And I should also say that the leading predictor prior to ours for like a decade was a neural network. So like, this is a field where like they already were using neural networks before like the deep learning craze happened. So it's not like we were coming into the field and we were like, Hey everyone, neural networks. They were like, yeah, of course, like <laughs> neural networks. We've been using, so like, we weren't like trying to act like we were bringing like fire from Olympus. It was like, yeah, right. everybody, everybody's already using neural networks, but could you kind of make better use of them? So like embedding layers and things were relatively novel approaches. So there were some ideas that we could bring to bear, but it wasn't just like a slam dunk to just use the latest neural architecture. And so what types of things are you working on now in your lab? Uh, well, nothing actually. My, I'm on leave from my lab. Oh. Uh, so well, what are you uh, working on? Or what are you up to? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I went on leave from my lab in January of 2020 uh, because I started a biotech venture creation firm uh, with two of my friends, uh, Adam Colum and Jack Millwood in mid 2019. Uh, so, you know, one of the things that I did with my lab, so I started my lab up in New York City and it was like purely computational. Mm -hmm. uh, but one thing that you learn uh, quickly if you're running an academic lab is that it's difficult to collaborate in academia. Uh, and it's a lot easier if you own sort of vertical research uh, ideas rather than being a person who brings like a skill into like a horizontal research network. Those are just a lot harder to build those horizontal research groups. And they're often built through like pedigree, like, oh, I did my PhD with this professor. And so I'm going to work with you. I mean, I had zero pedigree. So I re I recognize pretty quickly that this theory that my lab could be this sort of ally to many other labs was like, no one wanted an ally. Uh, so I, I had to kind of like build data generating capacity on my own. So I ultimately ended up building a wet lab uh, as well. And for a variety of reasons, realized that academia was a better place for me to be doing basic science rather than translational science. So this neoantigen vaccine idea that we worked on when it was like very early stage 
ultimately there were like several venture back companies that went public and you know had hundreds of employees working on the idea including BioNTech actually which is the vaccine that I got uh, the maker of the vaccine that I got for uh, COVID-19 which was nice so so there was a lot of you know 100x more resources could get put into that problem uh, on the commercial side versus the academic side so I decided to kind of like start angling my lab towards more basic science questions and, and doing mostly data generation with some computational work layered on top. So we started working on things like optimizing protocols for genome editing in T cells and growing organoids, which are like small three-dimensional uh, model systems to represent tumors in vitro that we could do more reliable experimentation upon. We, we layered some computer vision work on top of that, which was pretty fun. And we did some natural language processing work over the research literature uh, as well. But the lab became more of a traditional uh, biology lab than a, a computational group. But it's kind of like the sort of other part of that idea was that, okay, my lab should become more basic, but I want to have some translational work. And so the translational work, I decided to kind of um, funnel through this biotech venture creation firm that we created called Related Sciences. So yeah, for the last... Uh, two years or so, I've been working mostly full time on related sciences. And the idea of related sciences is to use uh, data to identify promising preclinical therapeutic opportunities and to create companies to then pursue those uh, preclinical therapeutic uh, opportunities. Wow, very cool. Awesome. Yeah. Well, thanks so much for your time. It's uh, it's such a pleasure to catch up and so cool all the things that you've done i love i love that i got a chance to hear all these stories so. <laughs> yeah no i wish uh, I, I could talk more about uh the, the fun machine learning tools and techniques we're trying out at related sciences some other time but i'm always happy to talk about my history as well yeah i really appreciate it yeah we should do a follow-up if you're enjoying these interviews and you want to learn more please click on the link to the show notes in the description where you can find links to all the papers that are mentioned, supplemental material, and a transcription that we work really hard to produce. So check it out.